So some people had some uh, some issues sending me the link to their map, and they sent it CalTopo. CalTopo is a free mapping program, just like SarTopo, but it doesn't have the um, SAR features in it, uh, such as tasks and so forth. So you got to make sure that when you send links, that it's the SarTopo.com link and not the CalTopo link. We went through that. So one of the advantages um, is once you save, so when you start working in SarTopo, as you did, uh, if you start drawing uh, lines and shapes and so forth, and you don't save it, when you close it out, you'll lose it. But the moment that you save it for the first time, it will always update without you needing to save in the future. Another huge advantage and um, uh, the line officers that plan the drills use this extensively is that once you save and share a map, anyone else you share that map with, uh, as long as you provide them access, they can go in and add to the map and change things and you guys can collaborate together. Uh, even if you know three people were going on a hike and you wanted to uh, plan out the route that you're going to hike on, the three of you can go in there, change things, uh, and everyone sees it updated live. We'll get more into this when we bring the map up. Uh, and of course, another advantage is that we can do remote planning. Um, there are many times when, um, especially on like Weiss um, walkouts, I'll head over to Weiss and meanwhile Jen is on her computer planning something out and when I get there I can see everything updated live. All right, so you can click on your um, Google account right here and it'll bring up um, all of these things down here. You can go into your maps and it'll have everything that you've saved. Everyone uh, hopefully now has the pro account. They just switched their subscription method. Um, it, it used to be a little better actually, but it's still pretty good. So now we have the basic uh, for free. And a number of people have um, inquired about the team account. Uh, that's something that uh, we get a 75% discount. It would cost us $500 a year. So we're gonna bring it up with the, uh, the line and admin officers and discuss it and see if that's something we might wanna do, uh, see what the advantages are in terms of collaboration. Uh, but right now everyone has a free basic pro account and that allows you, I don't quite remember, but something like 200 different maps. Uh, so you're pretty, you're pretty good there. Okay, we're going to go through some menu stuff. Let's see here. Okay, you got unsaved map up here. So uh, basically, this little red X right here is where you can switch between maps. Once you're already in a map, you can close it out by this little X. It's something that uh, it took me a while to figure out. Um, you can add features to your map in a few different ways. One, you've got this add menu up here. Let me see if I can go back. You also have adding new objects down here. You can also, and you'll see as we get into later, you can right click anywhere on your map and it'll give you basically the same exact menu. You can add a marker, which is a point um, with a bunch of information, a line, a buffer, which is a 
a line, let's say you were doing a, a, a task to go down a trail, but it was a, um, a mushroom picker. And the mushroom picker uh, normally picks mushrooms within 50 feet on either side of the trail. You can do a buffer um, task or line, which would actually include that buffer on either side of the trail or whatever line you drew. Polygon is, you know, we, we would do um, area searches. You can add folders, which we will get into later. On the left side in this area here is where all of your folders will be, your markers, your, uh, your lines or assignments, uh, your range rings, and so forth. Um, and there's a number of other things, clues, the range rings are there that you can add. Import export. You'll see here this Garmin GPS Connect via GPSIO. This is when you want to import or export directly from a plugged in GPS. Or you can choose, uh, usually you'll be working with GPX files, possibly KML files, especially if you're using Google Earth. Uh, and this one here, the GeoJSON file, that's when you want to back up an entire map and maybe put it onto a different map. Measure, uh, let's see if that comes up, good. So you can, uh, like I said before, you can right click anywhere and you can do this same menu. Uh, measuring is a great choice when you want to figure something out and you want it temporary and then removed. So if you want to uh, do an entire task, but you don't want it to end up being on your map, you can do that task and you can see how long it'll be, what the elevation profile is. And there's a number of other incredible tools in here. You can uh, measure, quote unquote measure, uh, what the forecast will be, what the sun exposure is on a certain day. You can even, um, uh, check the aspect, you can check all kinds of stuff. So it's fantastic and we'll get more into that later. Printing, uh, you can print PDF maps that, um, that actually have QR codes. And when you, you it's basically a geo-referenced PDF map that you can then import into Avenza. So let's say there's a, a task or, or a hike. Katia was just doing this the other day. Uh, you can import it into Avenza and then as you're doing your hike, you can see exactly where you are on that map with the little blue dot and we'll get into that more later. Uh, there's a whole section on Google Earth within this that we'll probably be skipping for today because we're trying to shorten things up. Uh, config are your settings and uh, you'll find that you end up going into here quite a bit. So I'll go over this in detail right now. Uh, and you know what, let me bring up a map. Bear with me a second. Adam, can you see the uh, the map to the right and the config to the left? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, let me just bring up a map. There's some. Uh... All right. Okay, so um, you can choose what labels are actually shown by the entire folder. You can get rid of them altogether, and this is helpful when you've got a lot of stuff in a tight area 
and the labels are covering everything. You can do it by entire folders. So that's the, uh, let's do the incident. Right here, you'll see labels hidden. See the ICP there? Do this one. That's all within config. You'll also see that within config, if you get rid of this with white background, they're not highlighted from behind. That might help or, or hurt depending on how tight the information is. You can set the visibility of things by folder or by item. So you'll see, I can now turn things on and off in this left column by getting rid of everything, right? The range rings are all gone and now they're back. But if you switch this to by item, you can now turn specific ones on and off. You can show your grid. You can also change the intensity of the grid itself. If it's getting in the way. By the way, when you print a map, the grid goes on automatically. This is where you also can change from uh, WGS 84 slash NAD 83 versus uh, NAD 27. You can choose your units here. Uh, I leave it on mixed, but if you wanted to choose something else, you can. And this is where you choose your coordinate system. You got a primary and a secondary. And if I bring up a point, let's see, this point right here, you'll see this is your primary and this is your secondary. And if you don't like it, go back in, switch this to degrees, and this one to degrees, minutes, seconds. And now if you click on it, it comes up that way. However, at any time, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, you can hit position and elevation and it'll bring everything up. This is actually how it's read. Where's my, uh... oh, when I'm in here, you don't see my red pointer, but you can switch this to NAD 27. So you're not, con you're not uh, doing anything to your map, but you can see the conversions, which is kind of nice. Uh, this is helpful as well. Show your position at the cursor or in the center. When you do the center, I don't know if you guys can see it, but right in the middle, let me see if I can, right by where it says green trail, you see the, um, the crosshairs. That is actually the position here. So when I move this around, you'll see all the, the coordinates and the elevation move around as well. So sometimes you might want to know an exact position, let's say the center of that pond, and that's the position there. But if you switch it back to the cursor, wherever you move your hand is what will come up there. And there's different times where you might want to switch that. Uh, you don't need to know about Hey, that. Scott, quick question. Go ahead, John. Quick, quick question. Um, I had trouble seeing that center cursor. Uh, is there a way to uh, enhance it or? Um... Not that I know of. And over the past couple of years of watching videos about Sartopo, I've never seen it yeah. other than that very light crosshairs. But if anybody on here, All right. if anyone on here knows of a way to do that, and that goes for this entire uh, presentation class discussion or whatever, if you, um, mm -hmm. If you have something that could enhance the, the, um, the discussion or um, enlighten us about some other feature that's in here, then please speak up. Okay. All right. 
Anybody have any questions on the config? Uh, again, you'll find yourself going back to here to switch things around uh, quite often, especially the coordinate system. I normally leave mine on uh, with national grid as the primary and degrees as, uh, as the secondary because that's really what we use the most. All right. If Adam doesn't see anything coming up in the chat, we'll continue on with the presentation. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've had a couple of little questions popping up, but a couple of us have been answering them as they go. So you're good. Fantastic. So the uh, search bar, as, as long as you're online, you can put uh, any street address in there. You can put any coordinate system in there. And, you know, let me just show you on a regular map. What's kind of cool is if you just go over it and you just uh, hover over it, it shows you the examples of how you can do it because sometimes the formatting gets messed up. Uh, you know, you might be copying it from Google or whatever it is, but you can always just hover over this area and it'll show you the examples um, of, of what the format should be. And, uh, and anytime you change it, you hit go and it'll go right to it. So let's, um, uh, let's do 56. So, and, uh, oh, so this is actually the perfect example. I put in 56 Carltondale Road in, uh, in Ringwood. It's on, but I can't see exactly where on the map it is. So I can zoom in here. I can switch my config over, instead of cursor, do center, so that now you'll see this right here is the crosshairs, and now I'll just hit go again. And that is exactly where it is. So that's the perfect example of when you might want to switch over to this um, uh, crosshair versus the, uh, the cursor method, which you normally will have on. You can also put in, you want to be as specific as possible, but you could put general things. If you put Ringwood, New Jersey in, it'll kind of just center on whatever it thinks Ringwood, New Jersey is. Um, it's incredibly intuitive. There's Rampo Reservation. So you can put in pretty much anything and it can figure out what you're thinking. area you've got the um, the map layers so uh, I don't know what this is going to show us okay good so right here is where you can uh, do your base layers and what's kind of cool is you can stack them together Let's see so within these, uh, you've got, you know what, let me bring it up on a regular map so you can see the differences. So right now I've got the uh, map builder topo. You can do the normal USGS. Maps. Um, you can do all of the, you can do a Google map, which is what we normally see on our phones. You can also do the Google satellite that you sometimes switch to. Uh, what's kind of cool is, let's say you've got map builder topo. Let's, let's do a, um, a normal uh, USGS topo map, but you can't really, although you can see the contour lines, you can't really uh, 
see the, the depth. So what you could do is you can add an additional base layer. And now you click in here and you can choose, uh, let's say shaded relief. So shaded relief is now at 0%. It's, a, it's totally transparent. So I can bring it up and give everything. Now, if I went all the way to 100, that's what shaded relief looks like. But what I'm doing is taking this USGS, just plain old topo map, and giving it some, some context there. Now you can actually, at, at whatever level you like, be able to visualize things better. So there is a ton to play with in here. You can, uh, it, let's say you like, you really want to see the, uh, the satellite image, but you want those contour lines on there. You can click that and now it'll overlay the contour line. So there's quite a bit to play with in here. Um, you need to spend a little time messing with it. There are some preset ones that combine different things and you'll see them over here under the preset layers. Map Builder Topo has a little bit of, of a few different things. The Aerial Topo Hybrid also does too. And you'll go over here and you can see what they have put together. Uh, they've got the satellite and uh, the scanned together. So you need to play with it. All right. Hey, Scott. Yep. The, uh, the one thing to be aware of when you're playing with layers is that the Google layers cannot be printed. And that may be in the presentation later, but because of Google's terms of service, because the information is proprietary to Google, you can use it on the screen but Sartopa won't let you print a map that's using a Google layer. It'll just print plain white. So just be aware that if you're playing with Google layers, you may have trouble with saving it to a PDF or printing it or things like that. It's best to stick to the, to the uh, regular Sartopo stuff. It is. Uh, I think it is uh, later in the presentation and it's a okay. good point there. Um, I believe that if you do try to print it, it will let you know that you need to switch out of it. Yes. Yeah, it will. Okay, we talked about uh, uh, the point info on the on the right over here. It's got your uh, your primary and secondary, your elevation, and then what datum that you're in over there. But by the way, Scott, is the version that you're using to show the live demo stuff under your account, is that the basic version or do you have the pro upgrade? Pro. Oh. Okay. It, well, you. it's the, the basic pro. The, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, the, it's the, the thing we would have to pay for, except because we're SAR, we get that level for free. Exactly. Have you, <laughs> have, have you noticed any differences on the map itself? Well, we're not sure. There, there are a couple of people who are saying that they, they don't see certain things that you have on your map, and I'm just trying to figure out if maybe that was the case. Okay. Uh, anything in particular that I might know? Uh, well, so, so somebody said you have, like, some Canada maps on there that they're not seeing. So... So the, the way that the levels work right now, uh, I think there are four license levels for Sartopo. The free version is free. The basic version is normally 25 bucks a year and they're giving it to us for free. Then there's the pro and then there's like the, the really, really super pro, like the departmental or group version or something like that. With offline. So, yeah. Yeah, desktop, desktop. Yeah. So, um, so most of us, if, if you've signed up with Sartopo, most of us have the basic version, which because we're search and rescue, they're not charging us for, uh, which is just a nice little upgrade from the free version. I don't know what maps are included in the different versions though. Yep. Uh, yes, I'm not using the super duper. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, so up here, uh, this is an unsaved map right now in this uh, presentation, but this is where your map name would be. And, uh, and we already discussed the little X there. We discuss that. Discuss that. Oh, configuration settings. Uh, we discussed all of that. Don't worry about that. Oh, this is kind of cool. Um, so let's put this over here. So it takes a little while for these to, uh, to populate, but you'll see, you could see wind coming across. Um, there's precipitation. The, uh, where is it? You got fire history, you got all kinds of stuff. So yeah, again, uh, you just need to play with it. Quick question, Scott. Go ahead. Um, how hard is it to bring in a user map, such as a trail conference scan, a uh, registered map or something? Is, is that possible with this? Or sure. is that way, way? No, 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 you could bring in uh, custom layers, um, geo-referenced uh, PDFs and so forth. Uh, I don't All know. Right. I don't know if this presentation goes into it. It is something pretty important to us. So if it doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe we'll do a follow-up on that. Scott, just where are they just put that on the list. Uh, Scott, where are they grabbing the weather data from? Is it NOAA forecasts? And how frequently is that updated? Uh, it is NOAA. Um, and let's see, if I do... Do a point info NOAA forecast. You'll see it comes up. So this is the information that it's grabbing from. I don't know how often it's updated or anything like that, but this is where it's getting it from. Thank you. Uh, same thing, and you might be able to go on the uh, Sartopo website and it might have more detailed information about um, all of the, uh, the items they provide, uh, such as the levels of snow and water and all that kind of stuff, uh, stuff coming from weather stations. So, but we'll, uh, we'll keep moving through this. Okay. To plot a point, uh, you, if you remember, there were three different ways. There was a, um, an add menu at the top, there's an add new object on the left, and then you can right click anywhere on the map and choose to add something. But we discussed a marker, and you can, down here, you can edit the coordinates. This is the label that you'll see if you choose to display it. Uh, comments, I'm not sure if that comes up on the map or if that's just um, information if you go into the point to look at it. I'm pretty sure that's all it does. And then uh, folders, which we'll get into later, you can switch it into, um, into different folders that you create or that are automatically created. So add marker and click OK, give it a label. So if everyone wants to, let's, uh, let's take a minute and uh, you guys can all bring up your maps that you've uh, already shared and uh, go ahead and make yourself a marker, give it a label, 
uh, mess around with the color and the style. So when you, when you all created a marker, a point, it would have created a folder right here called markers. Um, eventually that would become uh, crowded with everything and you'll create folders to organize yourself, but it's in the left hand pane. You'll have to get used to how you move things from folder to folder. It's not just a drag and drop kind of thing, but we'll get into that. All right, if you click, uh, as you saw I did earlier, if you click on the, uh, in this case, the Fremont Lookout name, a, uh, a pop-up comes up with the information about the marker itself. However you set it up in your config is how the um, coordinates will display. That looks like uh, UTM and, uh, and lat long. And I showed you this before as well. Uh, if you click on position and elevation, it'll bring up all the details and you can get either how you read it, or if you click this, um, this menu, you can switch it over to the other datum that you're not using to see the conversions. If you uh, right click on the actual marker, you've got some other options there. You can, um, you can drag to a new location, but actually if you, if you click edit, you can still drag it around once you click the edit. Uh, you can copy or convert it to something else. And then you can do other things um, besides manipulating that marker as well, such as uh, doing new objects or measure or whatever. Saving a map, one of the benefits of um, doing that whole sharing thing that we did before doing the presentation was that you've gone through this already. Uh, for anyone who didn't, once you make a change to a map, to a brand new map, that option right here will come up, save this map. And then once you save it, it'll continue to save anything you change. If you don't save it, when you close it, you will lose everything. Uh, over here, you'll get, so when you click save this map, you'll get this dialog box. This is what you'll name it. Uh, there's, there are some conventions on what we do. Uh, I think it's in the presentation. If you don't stick exactly to the, to the convention, um, it's not the end of the world. Usually we can figure things out, but you'll see that convention in terms of the date and what it's called for naming searches what you do on your own time. Save your account. Over here, there is a menu where you can either, I forget what the menu exactly says, but one of them is um, private so that no one else can see it. Another one is public so that anyone can go in and see it, but usually you will do viewable with URL. And we'll get into it in a bit, but you guys already shared it. It's a sartopo.com URL, and then it's got a four digit um, code at the end, and that's your specific map. And when you uh, quote unquote print PDFs, they will also have four digit um, codes at the end. And then anyone can either click on your link or you could just tell them the four digit code and you can do sartopo.com slash and whatever that is to bring it up. Now at that point, it will only be viewable to other people. You will be able to edit it, but other people won't. You need to give it a password, whether it's one, two, three, or something more complicated for people to go in and be able to edit while you collaborate.
Oh, and here is the naming convention. So you've got uh, the year, the month, and the uh, and the date, and then whatever it is. This is abridged in search. So uh, on September seventeenth, two thousand nineteen, and then <clears throat> when you click your uh, your Google account in the top left, uh, which you don't see on the screen right now, you will see all those. So let me bring up mine so you can click right here. It's got that fitterman at njsar.org and it brings up all these different maps that have been saved. Let's find a good one. Here's our drill at Tamarack. So, and we created uh, areas where we grid searched. There were hasties. This was the border of the park. Uh, and you can do all these things. And you'll see I've got a folder for borders, for grid areas, for the ICS stuff, uh, the different subjects where they were located. So you have all those. You'll see here under bookmarks, all of you guys shared maps and I've got them all bookmarked here. So if I want to bring up uh, Katya's map, <laughs> she hasn't done much in her map yet. So you can bring up all your bookmarks. You can also bring up the PDFs that you've made. You can even have custom icons, which I haven't done any in here, um, to put on your map. And I don't know if this presentation goes into it, uh, but that's kind of a, a, a neat thing to have. And you can actually get information on your account itself. I have a first responder basic account. So uh, Scott, there was a question about the number of maps. Does the, the number of maps limit affect only the maps that you can save or the total number of maps that you can access? Do you know that? Yes, save. You save. can have, as, as far as I know, there is no limit on the number of bookmarks you have. At the, bottom, at the bottom of your maps right here, I'm using 34 of the 200 non-public maps. So apparently uh, you can have, besides these, these private maps that you can view through URL, uh, public maps might not count but bookmarks doesn't have anything on the bottom in terms of limitation. So as far as I'm aware, you can bookmark as many as you like. Cool. Scott, and just especially for those of us who are helping, how do you bookmark a map? So, Uh, somebody would have to, so this map is already bookmarked. If somebody uh, shared a map with me, I don't have any. So what happens is somebody sends uh, the URL to you. Maybe they text you the URL. When you click on it, you will see right here, instead of it saying map is bookmarked, um, it says something like to bookmark this map. And you just click on it and then it becomes bookmarked in your list. Got it. All right, thanks. Hopefully that's, uh, they've got some pictures of that images in this presentation. So and I, I suspect, I suspect you'll cover it later. There was a request, it was a request to show the measure tool at some point. Yes, yes, that'll come up later. Yep. Uh, and everyone will, uh, by the end of this, will have vast experience in measuring and doing all of the basic functions, um, making markers, making lines, making uh, grid areas, and so forth. So as we discussed before, uh, you've got this. Uh, Scott, Scott, uh, if you want to show, I just sent you an email with a new shared map. If oh, okay. you want to uh, show them how to uh, bookmark it. All right, got an email. 
you know what? Let me even bring the email over here. Okay, so I got an email from Matt. I'm gonna click that, but it's gonna block it out. So I'm gonna move it off. I'm clicking it. And up came this map right here. So it says map is read only. So I'm gonna click this if you did it. One, two, three. Now it's editable. And now I'm gonna go right here, bookmark this map. And map is bookmark. Let's now click here on my account and let's see how clever Matt was in naming his map. So this is a good point. Once you bookmark the map, you need to refresh the page before you will see it come up in your bookmarks. So I'm hitting F5 right now. You can also refresh here and hopefully you guys all know how to do that. Now click it again under bookmarks and oh, you had an opportunity, Matt. <laughs> That's all you came up with. <laughs> That's the one I just bookmarked. Thanks, Matt. I didn't want to be put in the corner so soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, like I said, there's a four digit code at the end of all the URLs um, that uh, is specific to your map. Uh, you can send it as a text or an email, or you can just use the last four digits at the end of this. The password to share. Uh, so like I showed you uh, before, you've got the Your Account tab. And you can log out. It's one thing I didn't show you. You can log out and log in as a different account. We went over. Oh, where are you? Okay, so back to doing some practical stuff. Uh, everyone take a minute. Now add a line and a polygon on your own. Give them labels, change the color and style. Um, and you know what, I'll show you on my map because this is a kind of a cool thing. So I'm doing this actually on, uh, on Matt's shared map, which he gave me access to edit. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to do a new marker. I can go and change the coordinates right off the bat. Uh, let's move it a little bit and you can see it actually moved. Label it and here's some comments. Okay, so X, Y, Z. So the comments, I believe, I've never seen them anywhere except uh, when you edit it, you can see the comments. It might come out in printouts. So now, Let's do a new line. So you need to draw, you can edit stuff in here. You can change the color to blue or whatever. You can uh, change the uh, opacity. The styles are cool. Let's say that uh, it's a direction of travel and you can change it to look like this. Uh, if it's range rings, usually the convention is that one there. Sometimes I've seen that one, but you can do all kinds of different things with the style. You can change it and put it into a different folder, which again, we'll get to later. Uh, just leave it a track unless you're planning a route. You can change the line weight to be something thicker or thinner and label it. There we go. Now you don't want to hit it okay. You want to actually make the lines. So, you can do a series of points. So I'm going to click once. And now I'm just moving my mouse around to where I want to go. Let's say I want to go to over here. I'll click again. 
once you click on something, it'll actually follow the fastest way to get to another point. Now you can hold down the shift key and instead of doing these straight lines, if you hold down the shift key while you press the left button, you can draw with it. So let's say I wanted to go uh, to here, then I wanted to go around this white area, I'm holding down the shift key and now I'm gonna let go of the shift key and go at these angles. And whenever you're done, you double click. And now you've got that hasty task. So everyone go ahead and give that a try. I'll give you a, a couple minutes to mess with the different options. Uh, question, when I create a range ring, is there a way to specify in advance what, um, kind of line I want to use or do I have to go in afterwards and change the colors and line shape? So while you're creating it, so I'll, uh, since I'm sitting here doing nothing at this point, let me uh, bring up a map. So if I wanted to do range rings, this might be later in the presentation, but uh, let's create new range ring. So right now you can do multiple range rings at the same time. You can't select what it's going to look like yet, but you can do, let's say I want to do a, a let's do miles. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. I created all of those range rings and now they're individual ones. That's the reason you can't do it from the get-go is because you can do all you need right from the start. Now you'd go in and, uh, and edit them. There's bulk ops, but we're getting ahead of ourselves where you can change all of it at the same time. We'll go into that more later. How do you like... Like if you want to pause like the line drawing while well, like let's say I want to blow, zoom in or zoom out and I want to hit that button, like it, it, like it just keeps drawing all over the place while I'm trying to do that. So you got to play with it um, a bit, but you'll find that, uh, let's say I do, um, yeah, let me find a place where there's not so many roads. Let's go back to Ramapo. Maybe it's the roads that are harder, I don't know. Okay, so now I'm sort of in a green area. Let's create a, um, a new line. So right click, new line. So the first time I click, now I've got a point that I'm starting from. Now I'm just moving my mouse around. If I click here once, it lays down another point. Click here, it lays down another point. But now I messed up. So I'm going to hit escape and it goes back one point. Now let's say I click here and do one point, but I really need my next point to be way up there. I can click down and hold it, move the map, let go, and it hasn't laid a point down. So you need to play with it a bit until you really get the feel for it but you can hit escape to go back one point. Actually, you can hit multiple times. I'm gonna hit escape, 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 and I'm all the way back to that one. And you can, if you press down and hold it, you can move around anywhere around the map and let go and nothing has happened. You can also zoom out, move the map, zoom back in, and then hit the point. How, how did you do the? How did you zoom out and in without like messing up your line drawing? So on my mouse, I have a zoom wheel. Um, so if you do, you not have a zoom wheel? I, I'm using my daughter's Chromebook, and uh, it you know it doesn't have much user user function. <laughs> you might be able to pinch to zoom. Yeah, James. The other thing you can do is use the arrow keys to move the map. Uh, okay. 
Okay, yeah. But that doesn't zoom it, right? Yeah. Uh, when you stopped the line drawing to move the map back up, did you have to hit a key to, to move the map? Can you repeat that? I missed that part. Sorry. Uh, ask the question one more time. So you were drawing that line and then you needed to go up out of uh, range for to continue and you, you needed to not draw the line and move the map down a bit. How yeah. did you do that? Did you hit anything? No. So right now I am going to, I'm going to press my left mouse button and hold down. So I'm pressing my left mouse button and holding down and moving downward with my mouse. And then I let up and nothing has been placed yet. It just moved the map. Ah, okay. So you keep the, uh, the mouse button clicked while you're moving the map. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Scott. V Vito, Scott. And then the, and the, Vito, the other option. No, go ahead. Whoever's talking, I'll, I'll go after you. Uh, in care, that's referred to as panning, panning across the screen. And, um, yeah, I found that was a problem. I, I couldn't scroll down with the, using the uh, mouse wheel. Uh, I also got into that where, where my line went off the edge. Yep. Right, let me give Vito, this is the, the, the other option for moving, for panning, like I said, is use the arrow keys on your keyboard. <laughs> So right now, it, thank you. I just used, if you hold, if you hold down the arrow key, it'll slowly move a little and then it'll speed up in that direction. Also, John, if you just hold the mouse key down, but hold your left mouse key down, you can just move the whole screen. Yes, I just did that. Yes, I just did that. I, that that's referred to as panning, um, and, and when uh, with, with ca graphic operators. Then I'll get a little laundry gone. And just in case anybody needs to know, for those of us who are more evolved creatures and are using Macs, uh, two finger slides will uh, zoom in and out, and three finger slides will pan the map around. How do you how do you go between like the quickest route versus the, uh, the straight route? Like it just seems to intuitively like if I go on a road, it will take me that way. But if I'm not in a road, then it'll allow me to do the other way. So uh, new line. So let's say I'm creating a line here. When you're not when there's no roots, you could just click all you want, and it's not going to snap to anything. Once you hit here, you can hover over it if you want to get onto it and click it. Then, let me zoom out a little bit. Let's say I wanted to get over here. It'll find the fastest way to do it. But if you don't like the way that it's taking you, you can say, all right, I'll go part of the way this way and click. Part of the way this way and click. And now go over here. It's still telling me to go that way. So now I'll click over here. And now it's bringing me the other way. So that's one way you can lay down more points along the route. And how do you end it again? Double click. So usually you try to get, let's say I was doing a polygon, click once, again, 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 and then I try to get right in the area of that one and double click. And it does it, same thing with a line. Uh, you will notice that in the config, uh, and I skipped over this in the beginning, don't worry about the drawing, how many vertices, but the snap to, you can make it so that it snaps to lines and polygons, which can be helpful if you want to, if there are no roads or anything that you're going up to that it's snapping to, but you want it to go right up to another polygon, you can switch it to snap to lines and polygons or a few other things so that as soon as you get close to it, it will automatically go to that spot. 
Hey, Scott. Um, so when you were drawing that uh, this map, when you hit that trail um, and it was giving you uh, the option to follow the trail over over that loop, let's say you wanted to bushwhack across. Is there a way to unsnap it from uh, from the trail itself? So, so right where, yeah, where, where your mouse is right now, it was telling you to go over that loop, but let's say you just wanted to bushwhack right across. Okay, so if I uh, right click new line and I'm starting here, and then I get to there, right? But now I click once and I want to bushwhack to here. Correct. Instead of hovering right over the line, if you just start your bushwhacking and click once, now you can continue to bushwhack to it. Got it. Okay. So it's a two step process. Got it. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Snap to feature we talked about. Uh, we also talked about that uh, when you when you right click or you choose, let me just go over that one more time. So I find it easiest always to right click and choose new or whatever, but you can go to add and you can do all those things and you can do it down here. But, and let me demonstrate this as well. If I right click new line, I go in and I label it, comments, change the line weight, and do all that stuff. And I haven't drawn anything yet and I hit okay. Well, actually, it allowed me to do it. I think that might be an updated feature. So try not to do it anyway. Uh, you will also notice that when you first started creating them, just like with the markers, it created a markers folder. As soon as you do any lines or polygons, it creates a folder for them. You will eventually want to move those things into other folders that uh, organize yourself. So <clears throat> if you click on any line or polygon, it'll bring up a, um, a little menu, which you've seen a few times so far. Edit will bring up the exact same dialog box as when you created it, and you can go ahead and edit it. You can physically uh, move the point. You can... Um, change the name and all the same things that you did when you created it. If you click profile, it'll show you the, um, the elevation profile and some other information. And I'll kind of display it on here. Let's, uh, let's do this one right here that I created. I'm gonna click profile and I'm gonna take my mouse and I can actually, you'll see the little, you'll see that little red dot moving. I wonder if that'll change, hold on. Okay, so. As I move across here, you can see that I'm climbing, 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 and it shows you exactly where you are on the track itself. It'll show you the distance right here, I'm highlighting it, along the way. So it's kind of nice if you've got some sort of uh, task you can click on that task do the profile and you can see that at 0.29 miles let's do it where i can see it okay so right here at 0.57 miles i'm right in this spot right here at this elevation
Measuring. So there were a number of questions. Everyone can hear me, right? Adam, let me know if you can hear me. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good. So uh, there are a number of uh, people asking about measuring. Um, you can measure, which would temporarily put lines on the map to figure out certain things like a bearing or, um, or those um, elevation profile stats, uh, the distance to something, the area uh, that you might wanna create a polygon in the future. So you would uh, right click and do measure, and then you can choose one of those from that menu. Uh, view from here is uh, pretty insane, actually. And it'll create a new tab. So let's say, let me find a high point. So right here, I'm gonna right click, point info, view from here. It brings up a whole new tab and it'll take a minute and it'll show you the view from there. You'll see in the bottom right hand corner, it's showing you with these two uh, red lines what your, uh, your view is. So if I zoom out a little bit, you'll see my view is humongous. If I zoom in, it gets narrower. If I pan to the right or left, it will move my view. I can choose the height from which I'm viewing, but I'm gonna switch first from a plain old wireframe to wire imagery. That'll give me the wireframe and it'll give me what it actually would look like. Give it a second to refresh. Give it a minute to refresh. So you could actually, you got a subject out there and you're communicating with them. Um, you can say, what do you, uh, what do you see? And they see the, you know, uh, two small mountains and a big mountain. Um, you can actually bring it up in this and see what their viewpoint is from their location. You can also, Let's change it to 250 feet. So I'm higher up looking at it. It takes a while to refresh, so I'm not gonna keep clicking on things, but on the left-hand side, uh, you'll see you can, uh, anything that's within sight of you, you can click on those things and get a closer view or go in that direction to see what's up. Uh, and hey, hey, Scott. Yep. Go Scott. Ahead. Uh, if you want to see an example of this, um, if you go up to high point, they have all sorts of um, horizon view signs along the monument where you can see the whole horizon. It has it labeled like Camelback, you know, a certain town, whatever. Uh, I, that, that's what this is trying to achieve. Exactly. Um, I actually have a map uh, from the, um, the White Mountains, from Mount Shakura, and they, they have a whole horizon all along the edge of the map. It's very neat.
kind of cool. Okay, so let's move on. You can do, uh, I showed uh, Lacey before the NOAA forecast at, uh, from any point, it'll bring up the NOAA forecast. Uh, I think with any time within the last year, you can click different dates. Uh, the sun exposure on different dates. I think we talked about uh, importing and exporting a little bit before. Uh, the GPSIO, that uh, it, it does require a little bit of setup, but you can go in and out from a plugged in GPS, but most of the time you'll be using a GPX file. You see on the right hand here, uh, different options, including Google Earth. Hey, Scott. Go ahead. I noticed uh, I, I imported a couple of my GPX files into my map, and I noticed that you can't do the same things that you can do with your uh, objects. I was trying to get information from it, and just basically uh, you don't have any edit options, nothing. Uh, so sometimes when you when you import into Sartopo and if you change uh, anything, you can lose your um, uh, the time information, the elevation profile. Uh, so, but we'll go over that later. Sounds good. So the JSON that we talked about before, that's this over here. Um, it's basically when you're backing up the entire map. Uh, and we're not going to go into Google Earth because most people are not using Google Earth. So exporting. The export menu uh, is up at top to the right of the import menu. You, when you click the export menu, you'll get a, uh, uh, a menu where you can choose what you want to export. So you might uh, want to export everything on the map to somebody else um, in command, let's say, or you might want to check or uncheck certain things because you want to uh, send the GPX file to a task and you only want to send them their task and the tasks to the right and left of them so that they know uh, where their boundaries are or who they might you know, run into and what they're doing to the sides of them. So you've got different options when you export. Printing, like we discussed before, it'll print a, a one-page um, geo-referenced PDF or JPEG. Um, and that'll be an, an, another little half hour course that Katya can teach people on getting things into Avenza. Uh, as Adam brought up before, when you try to hit print and if you're using one of the Google map layers, it won't let you. So you'll have to switch your base layer to something else. There's one more option, which is kind of nice at times. Uh, one of the options is to print a coordinate list and it'll print every single point you've got on it, all the different uh, um, coordinates in, um, in lat long, in UTM, in US National Grid. So that can be helpful sometimes. When you do print, uh, it'll start a new browser tab where you can um, change what you want printed. Uh, and in the bottom right, it'll uh, put in a QR code to help you with bringing it into Avenza and other applications. And there's a number of different um, options within printing. There's an example of it right there. Here's your QR code. Here's your declination. Uh, you got all the normal information here, your scale, datum. As I mentioned before, these it's not technically printing it. It's just saving a PDF, um, but you have access to it online with uh, its own separate four-digit code at the end that you can share with other people as well. 
And this is where you'll find hey, Scott? it. Yep. Uh, did you say that that map, that PDF is georeferenced? Uh, yes. Okay, that's good to know. All right, I didn't realize, I thought it was just a um, print that you can get to. Okay, good, great. Uh, nope, it's georeferenced. May I add one point in there too, Scott? Please. Um, when you are doing any printing or transition, you know, exporting to a georeferenced map, also put the time and date that you're doing it so that we make sure that it, it would always be the most recent. Great point. Uh, we're going to skip over the Google Earth stuff. Hey, Scott, real quick. Go ahead, Pat. Uh, what Jen was saying, do you want us to save it with the time and date on the, in the title? Is that what you're talking about? You should be able to add the time and date. Um, either you can put it absolutely in the title of whatever you're saving it as. Um, but in the bottom of the map, there's, there's a space where you can write in extra information. So okay. just adding that so that uh, we know, you know, which, you know, which map we should be referring to. You have a call out. At 445 on July 2nd, you have an overdue mushroom hunter in the Crystal Mountain ski area. This, these are the coordinates that the vehicle was located at. I don't think you need to copy them down yet. It'll be on future ones. So you call Sergeant Miner. Uh, he's got a call for an overdue 50-year-old, 54-year-old female mushroom hunter. Her daughter said she left yesterday around noon and hasn't returned. She says her mom borrowed her computer to look up where to go hunting for mushrooms and then left saying she was gonna hunt for Porcini and chanterelles near Crystal Ski area. Mom is reasonably fit and no medical conditions. Patrol deputy found her car at the coordinates that uh, was on the previous slide. The mission number is right here. Uh, I don't think you need to copy it down. It'll be in a future slide. If not, I'll go back to it. So first thing we wanna do is start a new map. So you're going to uh, plot the coordinates on this new map that you create. And you are going to label it LKP, last known point. And you're gonna add a comment, subject vehicle. So everyone take a minute and... Hey Scott, we need a minute to go back and start a new map and make sure we're not just on top of the old one. Hang on a second. Absolutely. If for, for us that are in the slow class... we should class, use a question mark as yeah. the style. So hold on a second, hold on a second. So just a refresher. Remember the red X? You got a new map. That's where your name is. Until it's saved, it says unsaved map. Anytime you want to start a new one, you just hit this red X. I've forgotten it more times than I've remembered it. So I'm going to right click a new marker. Now, I already copied it, so I'm just gonna paste in the coordinates, but those are the coordinates. Uh, the, the label was uh, LKP, and the comment was, I don't know, subject vehicle. All right, and right now it's a red dot. So I hit okay. It's nowhere on this map. So I'm gonna click it in the left, and it goes right to it. So now I'm going to right click to convert this to a clue. I'm going to right click right on top of it. 
I'm going to right click, choose copy, convert to clue. As soon as I did that, it changed it to that question mark clue thing. And you can, if we, ha if we had tasks made, we could assign it. And I think uh, down the line, we might have some. So I'll hit OK. And it's now been converted over and put into the clues folder. So now, review the various map base layers and the overlays that are available. Uh, what this uh, project is going to do is it, it's going to demonstrate to you, um, I guess, uh, how to think out of the box if you need to figure out certain things when you're starting a search or if you're just trying to figure out uh, the best bushwhack on your hike with your family. <clears throat> so you're going to get a little exposure to the different uh, base layers and overlays. So decide where you're going to put the command post and put a marker there as well. You're going to give it the official ICS command post symbol, which is like a, it's a square with a half blue triangle. I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then decide where you're going to establish a staging area and give that the official ICS staging area symbol. So keep in mind that when you, uh, when you have a command post, it does not need to be at the last known point. In fact, usually it shouldn't be. Um, and the command post and staging don't necessarily have to be the same place. They can be near each other. They could even be a little farther apart. So you have to think to yourself, uh, what makes a good command post? What do those people in command need? And what makes a good staging area? And then from the maps that are available to you or the different base layers, how can you figure out what the uh, best location would be. So I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to ponder that and zoom in and out and try to figure out what their answer would be and go ahead and create those. Well, I'm going to just quickly go ahead and um, show you what I would do. Um, so for a command post, we're looking for a command post. Um, we obviously uh, would benefit from electricity, um, easy access, shelter from the storm, all that kind of stuff. Well, this is the woods right here. So I would zoom out. I'm also gonna look for a place that's got decent parking and uh, logistics can get to it and searchers can get to it. So I'm zooming out. I'm not really getting much here. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna switch over from satellite. I'm just gonna put on the Google map layer. And now I can see that there's a big, huge ski resort here, Bristol Mountain Resort. Well, that'd be a pretty good spot. So that looks like the, I see parking, hotels, I see different lots. So you know what? Let me switch back over to satellite. That looks pretty darn good. All right. So I'm going to stick my command post. I'm going to commandeer the lodge. And I'm going to create a new marker. I'm going to change the style by I click on style here, just normal left click. I'm going to choose the blue and white incident command post square. I'm going to call it the ICP. And I'm going to hit OK. That's the ICP. <clears throat> I've got a lot of people who can park next to the building, and it looks like there's a huge parking area here. So I'll just right click here, new marker. I'm going to change the style to the staging one. Call it staging. Hit OK. Give a symbol. 
Okay. Uh, so, I mean, there might be other options here. I just zoomed out and found the closest one. You got some stuff over here. Um, but that would have been a, uh, a good option. So a question about staging. There are parking lots that are closer, but they don't have as good access to command post. So, uh, you know, people go in and out of uh, between staging and the command post a bunch. So it's good to have it relatively close. It doesn't have to be. Um, you can have um, you can have different staging areas an overflow staging area. Uh, you know, it, the, the, the more areas you have, the more people you need to man those areas, uh, different staging area managers. So you need to take all of that into consideration. And this is more of a mapping course than a um, uh, uh, incident management course. But just basically from the, the information that was given to us, uh, having the staging relatively close to the command post away from the last known point, points to an area like that, where you got a nice lodge, tons of parking. So next, check the weather. Before we leave for the mission, it'd be good to know what the weather forecast is and was for the area when she left to see what she might have already gone through. So everyone can go ahead and right click on their subject vehicle marker, choose point info and bring up the NOAA forecast. Okay, so we checked the weather. It's snowing there. <laughs> So we, um, well, at least I did this before where I checked the view. Um, and this is the perfect example. Let's check what the subject could see if she were standing at the ridge on Northway Trail. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna right click on the ridge. And I assume they're asking you to do the ridge because you'll have a great view from there. And, um, and then choose point info, just like we did before to bring up the NOAA. Uh, report. And uh, after uh, point info, choose view from here. This will give you the opportunity to switch between the wireframe uh, and the imagery and a mixture of those two. And then you can even right click on a feature of interest to map that location. And what that's going to do is it'll bring up a whole new tab with a new map with none of the stuff on it that you've already done, but it'll be a separate tab. So for this one, I'll actually do it along with you. Uh, did it say where? Oh, on the ridge. So, um, well, I'll give you a, a, a couple of minutes to figure out how to find the ridge, the ridge trail, because <clears throat> I don't want to give that away. So you're looking to be standing at the ridge on the Northway Trail. So go ahead and try and do that on your own. You're going to have to figure out how you can find that trail. North Ridge Trail. Yep. Sorry, Northway Trail. You're looking to be on the ridge on the Northway Trail. Scott, we're just viewing from there. We're not putting a marker there, correct? Correct. So there's a few different ways <clears throat> for those who haven't gotten it yet, but I just switched to the map builder topo. It's one of the defaults I normally go to. Um, gives you 
uh, some topo and it gives you the trails and some roads and stuff. So I can see right here, this is the last known point. Uh, this is some uh, something I made along the way while we were talking. So there's two ways to delete that. You can right click and hit delete, or you can come over to the left side and hit the X, delete, just get rid of that. So this is the Northway Trail, if you can't see it, put on your cheaters, because every time you zoom in, the words get smaller again. The little joke on me. So, but this is the Northway Trail and uh, it's heading up this way. Up, 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 comes down, up, peak. I tell you what, I'm actually going to add, I'm gonna stack a layer and I'm gonna go under shaded relief normal. And that's now transparent. I'm going to bring it up a little bit just so I can kind of, so as I bring it up, I can visualize better somewhere up high. So, uh, I don't know, this is, this is the ridge, I guess, going across here. I'll, uh, I'll pick this spot right here. I'll right click, point info, view from here. So if our subject is uh, lost and hurt right up there on the ridge, it comes up with the wireframe, which loads up pretty quickly. I'm gonna just change it to see what they're actually seeing. Uh, you can do just the, uh, the imagery, you can do topo. I'm gonna do the wire imagery. I like how it has even the, the names of everything. Uh, I'm gonna pan around. And you can see as I pan in the bottom right, it shows you the view based on how zoomed in you are that you're seeing on this screen. You know what? I'm going to go up even higher. The main ridge is above the next turn switchback. So this is taking a long time to refresh. So everyone gets the point on what they can do with this. Let's keep moving. Okay, before we go any further, you should save the map. Now, a lot of you have probably already uh, saved it and shared it with your helpers uh, and you should have given it um, passwords but you might not have named it. You may not have named it um, what the, uh, the standard is, 2019-0731 Crystal. So why don't you go ahead, actually, um, we won't do that because that'll mess everybody up, but I will bring my screen up to show you. Right here in the save as, I would put that in, enter the uh, one, two, three, 
or whatever you want to do it. And it's now saved that way. Uh, there were some questions before that Adam and Vito were, uh, were talking about. When you're working on your own map, if you click your Google account, when I just saved it, it's now saved right here. And it says the last time it was updated and whether it's set to view with URL, whether it's private or publicly, which most should be view with URL. If it's somebody else's map that they shared with you and you bookmarked it, then it would be under your bookmarks tab. And you do not need to bookmark your own maps, your, the ones that you created and saved because they're already saved over here. Uh, once that's done, you would have paged out for responders to uh, meet at the uh, command post. Uh, you would have sent a link to the, uh, to the map you just created in your page. And here's an example. Here's the Sartopo link. And they would have also staged at Crystal Mountain Ski Area Parking. All right. There were some questions about range rings before, so we'll get to that now. Uh, one of the first priorities is to use lost person behavior to figure out uh, in the past uh, how many mushroom pickers uh, have been found within certain distances of the place last seen or the last known point. Um, so there's a, a, a Bible called Lost Person Behavior where you can look these things up based on age, um, activity, uh, things like that. We're not going to get into that today, but we will do the exercise of making the range rings. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna right click on the vehicle marker. That's our last known point uh, and choose new, or you can use one of the add or add new object uh, menu items. So you're gonna do new, a range ring, and you can do them one at a time, but uh, it's a lot easier since you're looking at the lost person behavior page, which will tell you 25% uh, are found within 0.9 miles, 50% within 2 miles, 75% within 4 miles, and 95% within 8 miles. So right off the bat, you can choose miles or meters. So you'll choose miles, and you'll put in, just as it is right here, 0.9, comma two, comma four, comma eight, and then click create. So I'm gonna do that along with you. Uh, here, let me arrange, arrange. make my map small. All right, where'd my last known point go? There it is. So right click, new, range ring. I'm gonna choose miles, 0 0.9, 2, 4, 8, and hit OK. And under lines and polygons, they all just popped up right there. So I'm gonna zoom out. And you can see they have labels. 0 0.9, two mile, four mile, eight miles. Scott, w one thing, there was a question earlier about how to edit the, the style for all the rings. Mm -hmm. If you click on the bulk ops link underneath that uh, point of the eight mile ring. Yep. I'll go, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So um, with the labels themselves, uh, you might want to um, see not 0 0.9 miles, but you might want to see that it's 25% ring. 
So what you can do is you can edit this specific one and change it to 25% and hit OK. And now it's just a little more descriptive. So you can do them individually that way. Uh, um, do it one more time, please, Scott. Absolutely. So here's the two mile one. There's two ways to do it. One, if I wanna change the label of this two mile ring, I can either hit this edit pencil, or you can actually hover over the ring until it gets a little darker and click it and then click edit. And now the label, you can change it to anything you want, but this one's the 50% thing. So I'm gonna put space dash space 50%. While I'm, while I'm in there, um, I'm going to change it this way, and then I'm going to uh, 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 demonstrate what Oren was talking about before, doing them to all the rings at the same time. So we're going to do it individually right now. I'm going to change this color to blue because it'll just make my life easier. Um, you can change the line weight, which I won't. I'm going to change the style. Um, I normally choose this one. Yeah, it's kind of a two-sided railroad. Uh, Jen, speak up if you want something different on, on these for the range rings, but that's the one I normally use. That is the one that we conventionally use, yeah. Yeah, that first one under um, ICS and fire. Perfect. So I'll show you that one more time on this one. I'm going to click it. I'm going to edit. This is the 75% ring, so I'm just going to write in 75%. I'm going to change it to blue. And I'm going to click the style and choose the first one under ICS slash fire. That one. And it displays it right there. And I'm going to hit OK. Now this will be an interesting experiment. Now that we did these individual changes, I'm gonna do the, the bulk ops that Oren was talking about and see if that affects um, the ones differently, like the labels. So bulk ops will apply to everything within the folder. So you can do bulk ops on markers. You can do bulk ops on lines and polygons, which I'm gonna do now. So when you hit bulk ops, you're going to have to highlight the ones that you want to apply it. So for us, I'm going to click on the first one, and I'm going to hold down the shift key and click on the last one. That highlights all of them. You can also probably hit the control key as you click, and you can add individual ones one at a time. So that's a standard feature that's just a, a normal feature in all applications, how to shift click and control click. So these are all now selected. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change, you can also print uh, individual maps, which I don't know if it'll get to or not, but that's nice when you got say four tasks built out and you wanna print the maps for each of them individually, you can go ahead and do them all right there. But I'm gonna change the attributes and uh, you're limited in terms of what you're allowed to do bulk ops to, but uh, you can change the folder. You haven't added any new folders, but you can change the color of all of them. Uh, notice that it's just a white because there are different colors. Let's see what happens if I change them all to red and I change all their styles to this crazy mess. I don't know what that is and hit update. And that applied to everything that I chose within that folder. So now I'm going to bulk up again. I'm going to highlight them all. I'm going to change the attributes. And now I'm going to put it the way that it should be. So I'm going to make them all blue and change the style to the first ICS oh, railroad. And then I'm going to oh, hit update. What's that, John? Oh, am I on? I'm not sure. Uh, no, I see now. It, it, the bulk attributes is for each folder. Okay. Yes. I, I was hitting the bottom one, and it kept going the clues. Yes. Very good. 
each one has that. Um, now these labels shown or not shown, you'll see here, I'm gonna change this. All the, the labels for the rings disappear and the labels come back. That option is only available if you have in your config menu, show labels by folder. If you have all, that won't work. You'll see that option goes away. So if you're missing that, you know to go into here and change it by folder. So now you have these range rings. Hey, Daniel, you had a question before about range rings. Did uh, everything we just go over, did that uh, answer it? Yeah, that was exactly what my question had been. Okay, good. It seems very inefficient to have to go through and do them sort of each ring separately. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions on this? And helpers, do we want to go into a breakout session to spend a little time on it? Or do you think we can move on? I think we're good, Scott. I agree. All right, sounding like a good consensus. And honestly, I mean, if you're in IMU, uh, then you probably have the experience with the range rings. And um, so for most others, unless you plan on, um, on uh, uh, joining IMU, you'll be using this more for your uh, personal hikes, for NJSAR to do tasks if you're a field team leader. You won't be doing range rings that often. Um, in fact, there are times when we might be exporting um, tasks to you um, and instead of choosing the range rings, we'll turn them off because it'll just get in the way of, of uh, what you're looking at on your GPS, which already has a two inch by two inch screen. Um, so, but at least this gives you an idea of what they are, how you can create them, how you can remove them if you need to and what they are. Okay, that's stuff we went over. Actually, one sort of question about the range rings is the theory. Like, because of the topography, some of the space is going to be much easier to access than other space. Does that affect anything, or we just put the ring? I, I didn't quite understand the question. Right, so some of this stuff, like, it's going to be much easier for them, for example, to just follow that river than it would be, um, right? So the probability is not going to be sort of flat within these rings. It's not really like... Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so uh, range rings are a, a, a general tool that applies to, to uh, the average incident, right? They take, uh, you know, say a thousand cases and uh, of Alzheimer's patients, and they were found within one twenty-five percent of the time. They were found within one point one miles. You now have that tool in your toolbox to apply to the search that you have now, but it's not going to apply exactly. So yes, if there is a barrier that is impassable, then that's actually a benefit to you. You know that your twenty-five percent ring. Although it includes it on paper, you don't need to worry about it. So you now have a smaller area to search if your objective is to, to search the entire 25% ring within the first operational period. So yes, you just apply it to the search. Lost person behavior as a whole is never 100% correct. You need to apply it so that you can, um, uh, uh, you have the best probability of finding. And you, there is no 100% ring, right? There's the, the biggest ring is a 95% ring because you got the rest of the world the person can be in. So all of this is just as applicable as it is. I could jump in for one moment uh, with regard to those range rings. Um, still make sure that they're always up. Just because we can cut out part of a search area doesn't mean we don't draw the range rings there. Yeah, how did, I don't even, I don't have those little checkbox on mine. Uh. So, uh, 
Jen, um, so I understood what you meant, but could you just say that again? Sure. So uh, when we're creating the rings on paper, we always make sure we're creating the full rings. We can then look at those rings and discount or fairly discount some areas within the rings or give a higher probability uh, to certain areas. But we don't want to not create the rings exactly as they are just because one area might have a 12 foot you know barrier that we know somebody's not going to be climbing over we still have those actual circles on paper but then we can use that information during our planning and, and one thing that uh, is learned by people in IMU over and over again is that even though you get these random clues, um, they love going to this person's house or they visited this gas station twice a day or whatever it is, it always comes back to lost person behavior. And you kick yourself afterwards saying, oh my God, if I just paid attention to lost person behavior and searched um, a a as uh, uh, what has the best probability, you would have found the person faster. Uh, so that goes to that point. Um, and, uh, but this is uh, IMU stuff. So it sounds like, uh, Daniel, you're interested in this kind of stuff. The initial actions course goes over this uh, in more depth. And unfortunately, the one back on March 15th was canceled because of the pandemic. Uh, it'll be rescheduled. So I encourage you to take that. Yeah, I was actually signed up for that one and sad when it was canceled. So uh, we'll get it going again. Uh, okay, so, 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 so and for everyone who has signed up, I have books sitting here at home. <laughs> so uh, James mentioned that he doesn't have these little checkbox, right, James? Uh, correct. So if you go into your config and you can set visibility. what it is? Ah, by item. Okay, I see it. Right. So right now yours looked like this and you can switch it over. So you'll, like I said before, you'll find yourself going into this little tiny config menu um, quite often, surprisingly. So uh, next, adding folders. Uh, anyone have any more questions before moving on to folders? Okay, good. So uh, the PowerPoint presentation would like you to add folders for incident facilities, your LPP, LPB data, and uh, Intel investigation stuff. So like clues. So you'll see over here on the right, um, they've got incident facilities. Uh, I, normally we write ICS. Uh, and put the ICS stuff under here. I don't, you know, to, to Matt's point, we really need to um, come out with a little cheat sheet with exactly what all this stuff uh, needs to be for NJSAR. So we'll make sure that that happens. So, but for now, um, either use incident facilities or ICS. And then LPP, LPB data, clues should already be in clues because uh, it creates that folder when you create a clue. So I'll demonstrate how to do it. It's very simple. You can either do, same as all the others, new object or add. I always just right click, new folder. Give it a name. I'm gonna give it the name ICS. Save. I now have a new ICS folder. Now I need to get these two things, ICP and staging, into there. You can do it bulk ops. So I would hit bulk ops. I would highlight both of these things, change the attributes, and I would switch it into the ICS folder. So you can go ahead and try that if you want. I'm gonna cancel, I'm gonna now do it individually. So for CP, I can either click 
and then go and click on again and edit, or I can just hit this pencil icon to edit. And within here, you've got folder. I'm gonna switch it to ICS and hit okay. And it's now moved up into the ICS folder. Same thing here, click it, ICS, okay. Now let's say um, I wanted to do a different one that's uh, range rings. So I'll uh, right click, new folder, range rings. This is not our standard. I'm just doing this as an example, range rings. So I now have range rings. I'm gonna do bulk ops and I'm gonna choose these three because uh, I don't want the 95% ring in there for whatever reason. I'm gonna change attributes, move it into the uh, range rings folder and hit update. And that one stayed and the other three went in. You'll have a few, uh, I don't think this, uh, I'm not sure if this is gonna go over it or not, but um, if you create a new line, you just have a, a, a line, it's, but you can get that line with task attributes. So um, it's called a line assignment. So instead of it just being a regular line, I'm gonna click around and make my line. And it created the assignments folder all on its own. That's where the tasks are. I'm gonna go ahead and edit it one more time. I'm gonna give it, uh, uh, it's task number 33, letter Sierra. And you can change all kinds of stuff within here. Uh, I won't get too much, your POD, how many people are on it, two people. Uh, and this all matters because when you're done and you create an assignment, actually create resources in here. Like I can put uh, uh, Jen Enberg and Pat Dwyer and Adam Levin all uh, as resources and then assign them to this 330 task and print out the 104, which will have them in it. So that's how this all applies. Okay. Uh, adding an assignment line, which I uh, went over briefly before, uh, those are our tasks. So add a hasty team assignment to go from the sucks vehicle up Northway Trail, then south along the ridge to the top of Mount Rainier, the Mount Rainier gondola, and then down the hill back to the command post. Uh, you can see over here on the right what they want you to do. So you're gonna go up here along the ridge. Across and back up. Now, you're not going to do a line. This is going to be an assignment. So to get you going, you'll do a line assignment, not line. But line, you lose some of those uh, task attributes that we saw before. Helpers. Uh, try the breakout room for this one. I don't think it's necessary, Scott. If we can avoid it, it's better. All right, I'll give this one five minutes um, to give you some some quiet time to do it. Uh, reach out to your helpers uh, if you need help. Oh, you know what? 
Um, while you're doing this, there's actually some slides that describe it. So let me, let me keep moving through this a little bit. So it actually says, it gives you some information to do it. So when you add the line assignment, they want you to call it 1-01 hasty. So that'll go in the number field. Uh, you don't need to write all these details in, but that's what you would put in your, your details, put something in there. Uh, your primary and secondary frequencies, which would go right here, prepared by your name and uh, that it's prepared is the status. And when you're putting that information in, make sure to draw the assignment before clicking OK. So uh, what's the distance of that assignment? Uh, by now, you guys are becoming experts, so you should already know how to do that. <clears throat> A lot of Sartopo is just clicking on stuff, right? So if you just click on any specific uh, marker, uh, a ring, a line, whatever it is, and you're given information here. And this will give you the exact length of whether it's an assignment or a line, whatever it is. So in this one, it's asking about the assignment. So, all right, so I actually converted mine to a polygon but it uh, says that it's 100.78 square miles. So if you had a line assignment, it would tell you the length. Uh, now it's asking about the elevation profile. What's the highest point? What's the total gain and loss at any time? We went over this earlier. You can click on on a line and uh, hit the profile, and as you move your cursor to the right and left, the dot moves along the line, and it shows you uh, slopes, the highest point. Uh, you'll see right here that it's uh, 7,410 feet of elevation gain and the same amount going down, because um, it's going back to the same point. So this is actually a mirror image of itself on the right and left. So if I had a different one, new line from here to here, and I did the profile of it, as I start here, I'm going all uphill. It's got a total gain of 1,104 feet and a loss of 81 along the way. Uh, at any point, you can see how far you've traveled right here. And when you get to the end, the total distance was 1.98 miles. Print the assignment map from the info box. Notice you don't get print menu and it doesn't save it to your PDFs. Uh, notice it automatically sizes to cover the actual assignment that it's printing. It'll also add the, the, uh, the grid, U.S. National Grid grid. It'll have the, uh, the title of the map will be the name of the actual task. And then you can, uh, you can email the GPX or text or, uh, yeah, email the, the, the GPX file to, uh, to your task leader so that they can bring it into their um, GPS. I will, I'm going to add a few things just so that you can see it on the 104. So this is assignment. When I, when I printed that map, it didn't give me the, um, the QR code. Is there something special I have to do for that? There's check boxes in there. 
Uh, so wait, were you printing from the print menu? No, I was printing from the, if you click on the, on the task, there's a print map. Um, yeah, we're, and that's what we are doing. You're doing the right thing, but I don't think you get a QR code with, with those prints. You only get the QR code when you print an actual PDF map versus. Okay. Or, correct. So I'm going to add, I'm going to do a new resource. All right, I'm going to make Oren be on a task. I'm going to assign him to S33. He's a person from NJSAR. So you can print the map. So I'm going to bring up the 104. And you'll see this is what we normally hand write. It's got all the information in it, including the resources you've assigned to it. It has the size of the assignment or length of the assignment. It gives you the PODs that you could have chosen in your assignment. It'll give you, if you entered them in, your primary and secondary frequencies um, and all the other information. So that's kind of cool. It has your task number and uh, over here on the right, it would have your op period, which I'm surprised this, um, I mean, there's a few more slides left. Maybe they'll do op periods, but uh, uh, that's an important feature that Sartopo has. So I'm gonna close that out and now I'm gonna print the map itself. Sometimes this takes a, a minute or two to render. You all are taking up my bandwidth. So Scott. You're, you're when, welcome. No, go ahead, have, gotcha. Uh, when you have a chance, you're not doing the print from the top line of the in Sartopo. Correct. A print of the assignment. Exactly. So if you just click on any assignment, right? And now that it's an assignment, not just a, a line or, or a polygon shape, but it's, it's an assignment of some sort, either a line assignment, a hasty assignment, or a, uh, <clears throat> or a uh, area assignment, you can assign clues to it, waypoints, uh, resources. You'll see Orin is one of the resources in there. Tracks if you've downloaded tracks. But you can also print for that task leader to have their map and their 104. So, uh, and that is different than when you print here and you just print a straight up PDF georeferenced map. So from here, when you print map, that's what you get. Uh, oops, it's still loading. Is it taking a long time for you guys to print? Oh, here we go. Okay, so you'll see there is no QR code, uh, but it does have the declination over here. Uh, it's um, calculated the scale and put it down here after basing the map size on what the actual task is. So it's optimized that. And of course it has the datum on it and, um, and the name and all that stuff. Did that answer your question, Katya? Yes, it did. And then tell me again how I get that QR code. So you wouldn't for this. Right. If you wanted to just print a straight up map, you would print, you go to the print menu up here, uh -huh. PDF or JPEG. I just don't remember seeing the QR code then, but I'll double check. Okay. You can even do uh, customization, customization of the QR code here, which I have not done, but you can. So a question um, about this. It see, I assume that that scale is based on printing it to letter paper. Uh, is yes. there a way to select a different paper size? I think there, there is. There definitely uh, was that option in one of the screens. 
Uh, I haven't needed to print a letter, but you've got paper size when you're printing a regular map right here. That's the one that I was doing with Katya's. Yeah. <clears throat> But let's take a look when I uh, when I print a regular map. No, it goes straight to it. It didn't give me a dialog box. As far as I know, there's no other settings where you would put that in as a default. So um, it would be for eight and a half by eleven. At base, do we have a larger scale printer or is it all 8.5 by 11? Uh, until about uh, a week ago, we had a huge plotter, but that is actually being used at one of the... Um, one of the COVID-19 testing stations. Uh, I don't know if that's going to end up getting donated or not, but we found that we weren't really using that large plotter. Uh, and that we were using eight and a half by 11 printers. And just to let you know, yes, I got the QR code when I did the regular print this time. Great. So you'll see mine came through finally. And uh, like Katya was talking about, here's your QR code in the bottom right. But again, that only works when you're printing a one page georeference PDF map from the top menu, not when you're doing a task. And, um, and to continue with uh, Daniel's question, you don't normally want to be handing your uh, FTL anything really bigger than a 8.5 by 11. So this is really to be printing an assignment to be handed to the FTL or a few of the members to be carrying around. Are there specific settings you recommend us that we use if we ever were to print one of these out? Uh, so when you hit print, you don't have the option for settings. Do well, I do if I want to do the one with the QR code? Oh, 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 yes. Okay. Wow, that one went through a lot faster. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, geospatial PDF. So so, James, the only thing that I often will do is up at the top left where it says scale, mm -hmm. I'll often change it from not fixed to a given scale, just because whether it's like 1 to 24,000 or 1 to 12,000, it's a lot easier to look at a map when it's a constant scale. Um, it also means that most of, this, most of the map tools that we have um will will work better so if you think about the trail conference maps like a lot of times they'll print to whatever scale fit on the page and we end up with real, really weird scales um if you just say no not fixed here it will print to whatever scale fills the page Right. So you, which is there one that we use most commonly? Is it one to twenty four thousand, or which one? Yep. And should we cl click the uh, USNG one box, or should we, which 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 for the grid lines? What which one do we typically use? We use US National Grid. Right. Um, and we should stay in the habit of US National Grid. I mean, you can select whatever you like. Um, it also depends on the other maps that you're using. Uh, if it makes it uh, easier to go along with whatever trail conference map or whatever it is. So it's, it's up to command's decision, but US National Grids are standard. Uh, you can also change the size of the boxes. So it's a, uh, 215, uh, so two things. One, if anyone does need to drop off, uh, I wanna say uh, there's some great attendance. There were over 40 people in here and hopefully uh, everyone got a lot out of it, but it's only a beginning point, obviously. And there's tons of toys to play with in this application. Um, and I'll, uh, um, it would definitely be great to get uh, feedback emailed both on the, uh, the Zoom meeting and how that worked and how it could work better. 
as well as Sarcopo itself. I'm going to continue along for the next 15, 30 minutes or so and finish this out. Uh, we've got um, we've got a buffer assignment and we've got clues and operational operation periods. We've already gone over bulk, bulk operations, and that's basically it. And then exporting, which we went over to. So uh, we have a few more things coming up. So stick around if uh, if you can. But if you have to drop off, understood. And Scott, are you going to do? Uh, buffer again. I had done a buffer on a line when we were first practicing, but if I wanted a buffer around this track that we've just laid, will you go over that again? That is a, a buffer on a line that already exists. Uh, that we could not figure out how to do. Yeah, so S Scott, I, I think to create the buffer on an existing line, I would, in config, I would change your snap to lines and polygons, and then say new buffer and trace your line. So let's say you got a line here. Oh, whoops, it's not gonna work on here. Close these out. Yeah, what would help would be to take this track we just made that sort of circles around, um, well, I, I didn't do that one. So well, me, just make one, yeah. So let's do a, a new. Hey, Scott, it's Pat. I just need to let you know I'm going to jump off for about five minutes. Okay. okay. Okay, so I switched it to um, snapping to lines and polygons, which will snap to the stuff that I've created in here. And now I'm going to do a new buffer. And uh, let's choose, uh, all right, 100 feet sounds good. So I'm, I'm hovering right now. So I'm not clicking anything. As soon as I hover and I get on it, I'm going to click. And you'll see... As I keep going down here, and I'm just gonna, I'm holding down my left button and dragging the map and letting go so it doesn't click anywhere. I'm gonna go to the end, I'm gonna double click. Now let me zoom in so you can see it better. It just created a buffer on top of my line. So now I haven't been naming anything, but you could certainly delete your line underneath by if I had named it I would know which one of these lines it was. Uh, you can delete that and then use that as the buffer. But to convert the line to the buffer as Oren was talking about, um, we haven't found a way to do that. No. All right, any other questions before we continue on? And the people that Pat abandoned, you guys can uh, speak up if you have any questions. Okay. So we'll skip the second line. Uh, you can assign statuses. Uh, there's like a draft, uh, prepared, in progress, and then completed, I think. Um, and that way people in command um, know when something is, uh, it's in draft, so don't mess with it. It's prepared, uh, so that means it could be assigned. Uh, in progress means ops now had it and already assigned somebody out, and completed means it's all done. And there you go. What I just said. Buffer assignments. Uh, Sergeant Miner arrives and tells you he's been reading the website the subject was looking at. It says porcini mushrooms are found along the edges of ski areas where it meets the trees. He wants you to search the closest ski runs and past the edges into the trees about 25 meters. So um, we just uh, did that a little bit, but why doesn't everyone take uh, three minutes and go ahead and create a buffer assignment?
So this actually is an assignment. It says add two buffer assignments along the edges of two ski runs, enter the offset, set the status of both as draft. And it's suggesting that you use the satellite images to draw the lines. Scott, uh, quick question while people are working on that. There was, um, I, I wanted to, for one that I was working on, I wanted to kind of like um, indicate a parking, like an alternate parking location. Um, but when I went to print the map for the specific assignment, it wouldn't show that, that particular parking spot or that marker. Is there a way to link um, or include other types of markers into the assignment maps or um, it, it may, maybe you don't know the answer to it, but I just want to ask if someone did. Uh, I, I've never um, had the need to do that. I could see where you would. Um, yeah. I can think of a few possibilities, one being that you make it a resource, um, the parking resource, and then assign it to that uh, task. Um, but there are ways to assign, so under assignments, you've got waypoints and resources. So I haven't tested this out, but I bet that there would be a way to assign uh, a marker or, uh, or a waypoint or something to an assignment, and then it should be included in the printed task. Thanks, Scott. Yep, if anyone knows of a surefire way of doing it, speak up. Otherwise, uh, I'm writing it down to test out some things and figure out if we can do it. Okay, so. So how would you get within like 25 feet of the tree layer? So you'd have to go, you would have to outline the ski thing and then add a buffer? The run? Or can you go right there? Or do you just go down the it, middle and add it a little bit? J James, what I ended up doing was, um, if you remember Scott said earlier, if you hold the shift key down, you can kind of click your mouse and, and free draw your line. Uh -huh. So I held the shift key down and traced the tree line. All right. So if you uh, I want when to I hit shift, it's not it's 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 just going a straight line. It's not it's not free drawing. Are you sure it's shift? Yeah, it's shift. Yeah. So, so maybe on a Chrome it works differently. So, so if, I, if if you start to draw your line and hold the shift key down and then hold your mouse button down and drag the cursor, it'll. Yeah. It'll freeform the line. Yeah, I guess on a Chrome it doesn't work that way. Um, I'll have to try it again when I do it from my regular laptop. So it won't it won't work like you're holding the shift key and I'm just hovering. It won't work yet. You actually have to click the left button and then start dragging while you're holding the shift down. Yeah, I'm. Um... Which means that if you're using a trackpad like you have on the Chromebook, you have to click the trackpad and then move your finger. You can't just move your finger on the trackpad. So you hold the shift button with one hand, you click the trackpad with the other, and then you drag your finger while you're still holding down the trackpad. 
Yeah, that's what I'm doing, and it's not working. So I click. It does illustrate the difficulties of um, of not using a normal mouse. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, my guess is it'll probably work on my laptop, but my yeah. Chromebook is like, you know, I guess it's a piece of crap, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone... <laughs> It, it, it's a Chromebook, no sub. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys all get the idea. You can uh, continue to work on it on your own, and there might need to be a follow-up uh, much quicker, you know, one-hour class at some point down the road where we uh, quickly go over things and answer questions. But we'll keep moving now. So a clue, I can't remember uh, if we went over this. Oh, yes, we did. We did a clue. We don't need to go over that. Does anyone need me to go over a clue? Okay, we did the clue. Operational periods, we did not. So operational periods are, um, are created the same way everything else is created. Right click new or use one of those menus. New op period. Okay, so let's name it op period one, op one. And we'll make it uh, purple. Line weight two, okay, all that's fine. It will now create an operational periods folder right here. So now uh, let's take this line right here, uh, which is not name. Let me, let me edit it. I'll name it test. Okay, so that's now your test name. So what I'm going to do, that's in lines and polygons. Oh, I can't do that. I need to stick it. It's got to be an assignment. So let's use S33. Edit. Okay, so you have to, you can't choose one of the lines or polygons. You got to choose one of the assignments because you would only put a task in an op period anyway. Uh, edit it by one of the methods that we discussed before. Now you'll notice that right now this is red, this assignment. When we switch this operational period, we're going to assign it to op period one. Now this comes in handy when you've got uh, the plans group doing plans for the next two operational periods. They're doing tasks after tasks so that ops can go and assign them out later. So you can org organize those tasks into which op periods you're going to um, deploy them. So I just assigned it to op one and you'll notice right here that it now just turned purple. And under assignments, when you've got a hundred different tasks, it's much easier to deal with when they're under uh, the different op periods and they're colored similarly. So that's how you deal with op periods. So uh, it's nice to be able to change this to status. So you can change this to status and now it's based on whether things are prepared, whether they're already completed. Um, so that's sort of hidden in there and uh, it'll be nice to have a cheat sheet that has where things like that are located, but that's an option. All right. That's a huge thing too, to be able to see what uh, assignments are currently working and what has been completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're not gonna actually run through this. You can bulk edit them. Okay, add an assignment area, which is very similar to uh, doing a polygon instead of a line, an assignment area instead of an assignment line. And you can set the statuses. Uh, this is an example of it. <clears throat> Same as the hasty that you did, you would just draw the polygon. Again, you can hold down the shift key and, uh, and freeform, or you can click uh, by vertice to vertice around an area. And all of the same options are available in terms of POD and how many people are on it. And this will all print in the 
ICS 104 task form. Oh, and look at this. This is what Jen was talking about a minute ago, where you can change what you have the colors um, coded by. Uh, it, by default, it's operational period, but switching to status is very important. Exporting assignments is, uh, is huge, both on a, a personal level and uh, for searches, because you might design your hike in this, um, or you might design yourself a, a, some sort of navigational um, puzzle to go through and uh, you can export that and put it on your GPS. Uh, same thing we talked about before, you can go directly into it or you can export a GPX file and then either import it into another application that you might use like Basecamp uh, or uh, import it into your uh, GPS, however you normally do that. Google Earth. Uh, I'll just show you this. When you export, I'm going to export a GPX file. I can choose anything or one thing. I can uncheck. I can uncheck entire folders, uh, specific things within it, whatever I um, uh, want to bring into my GPS for that specific uh, hike or possibly everything I want to send over to a field team leader. Uh, with the nearest five tasks. We went over printing individual maps. Uh, you can bulk print them so that uh, you've got 10 tasks that are going to go out and uh, you select them all and hit print individual maps. So uh, under assignments, whatever, I can print map or I can go in and do bulk ops. And I can, there's only one in this folder, but you can select them all and hit print individual maps. And you can even specify a scale here. I demonstrated this before, the 104 form with everything filled out, which is uh, pretty cool. And thank you to Matt Jacobs and Sartopo, Sartopo for the content used to create this course and the pro deal that, um, that almost everyone on the call put to good use. <laughs>